grow in their own relationships. So we've been looking at evidence that the Bible is the word of God. And we have this verse here that speaks about the idea that for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. In other words, they were inspired by God to write. Now, inspiration, that idea of inspired is, is not the idea that I was inspired to, to write a song or I was inspired to, to do this or that, but the actual idea is word for word that it was God breathed is the idea of that word inspired. And so it's not the idea that they were just one day was inspired to write something about it. Uh, no, these are things in which God breathed and gave them the words in which to write down. So that's a pretty big and heavy claim that they are making. And so we've been looking at how we can look at God's word and see, is that true or not? Uh, we've been looking at, in the young adults, class and how um, in the Old Testament, there are several places over and over and over and over again where it says, and God said, or the Lord spoke, or it said, God said to Moses, write these things down. God said to Joshua, write these things down. And so it is the, the Old Testament is replete with all of those kind of things claiming that God spoke, but that in and of itself doesn't make it God's word. Okay, and a lot of people back then took that as God's word. Now today, we're a little more skeptical. Well, what other evidence can we find that would confirm that this is the inspired word of God? And so a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the idea of the unity of the Bible, that there is 1,500 years from the beginning of Genesis to uh, the New Testament of writings. There's 40 different authors. So we've been talking about the unity of the Bible. We looked at how there was one God that we see throughout the entirety of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We looked at that there's one problem, sin being the problem in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Jesus being the solution to that problem. We find that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then we looked also at the idea of the unity that's found in the Bible with Noah in the flood. And we see that's throughout the Old Testament. It's quoted in the Old Testament as well as it's referred to and quoted in the New Testament all talking about things that actually happen in Genesis, talking about the flood. And then we looked at the Lord's Supper as well, and how Jesus and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Lord's Supper there is, is talked about on the night that he was betrayed. He gave and took bread and also the fruit of the, uh, fruit of the vine and gave to his disciples and said, do this in remembrance of me. Then we went to 1 Corinthians and talked about how Paul at the time where Jesus spoke to his disciples in the upper room was Saul. Saul, who was against the way, would be against the way, and would uh, persecute those people who were in the church. So several years later, okay, if we'll find this in Acts, that Saul then becomes Paul, and several years later, Paul never meets Peter. Paul doesn't know Peter from the beginning. It's not until several years later that they come around and he comes back to Jerusalem, and Peter and Paul meet together, and basically, I'm paraphrasing here, they kind of exchange notes on what they're teaching. They realize, hey, we're teaching the exact same thing. And the right hand of fellowship is, is given. They're saying, okay, I'm gonna, Paul's going to go on. He's going to teach the Gentiles. Peter's going to continue to teach the Jews. But we're teaching the same thing. Paul is telling in Galatians, in some of his other notes, that I never, the things that I learned, I never learned from man. I learned from Christ. I learned from Jesus. And so when they compare those notes to Peter, several years later, it's in fact the exact same thing. So we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul ish, uh, initiates, or excuse me, reminds everybody about the Lord's Supper. And he's basically quoting some of the things that Jesus says on the night that he was portrayed. But then we also went and looked in Genesis chapter 40, and looked, excuse me, at how Joseph... And when he was put in prison, he was put in prison with the chief baker and also uh, the chief winemaker. And we looked at how those connected back to Jesus and the Lord's Supper. The wine bearer, the chief cup bearer, was spared. He was in prison and he was spared. The chief baker was killed and hung on a tree. And so we looked at that and how there were so many similarities to Jesus. There was three days. There was do this in remembrance of me. There was restoration and there was wine and there was bread. How can we not see the connection to Jesus and also as well as the Lord's Supper? Only God can write something like that. And so now I want to bring us to kind of a new uh, 
place for us to consider uh, with, in reference to the Bible, and that is science in the Bible. Now, as you go through and you read in your Bible, there's not, the Bible's not written for science. It's not a scientific book. Okay, it's not written for that reason. But when you go back and you look at some things, you can find some things that are scientifically accurate that helps us to understand the inspiration of the Bible. Well, well, why would that be the inspiration of the Bible then? Why would that confirm it? Well, it talks about things that weren't discovered for several hundreds of years and sometimes thousands of years when it's written. That they didn't take the concept or the idea of the time that was illustrated, but was given some information that they should really have had. So let's look at a few things. I want to look at this quote here. It says, one of the most interesting arresting evidences of the inspiration of the Bible is the great number of scientific truths that have lain hidden within its pages for 30 centuries, only to be discovered by men's man's enterprise within the last few centuries. So we're going to look at a few of those things to get uh, this morning. And I would encourage you, if you like to write in your Bibles, to highlight it, to underlight it, and write on the side of it what we're going to see. Uh, first, we're going to look at astronomy. Okay? So what I would encourage you to do is look at Isaiah 40, 22, and if you like to write in your Bibles, underlight it, highlight it, and say, astronomy, fact. So let's look at this here. It says, first, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40, 22. So we look at that word circle. That's the Hebrew word meaning roundness or sphere. Roundness or sphere. Okay? During this time, and, and not until uh, the 17th century or so, People were thinking that the world is flat. Now I know that somehow we have kind of circled back and now we think that the world is flat again. Okay, well, you know, the horizon is a pretty good indication that the world is not flat. We'll just start and stop there. Okay, when you see a ship go into the uh, distance of the horizon and then it disappears, it gets lower it's a good indication that the world is not flat, but it's round. Okay, if there was no horizon, if there was world's flat, we would be able to see it. We get some binoculars, and we could still see it. We get a telescope, and we'd still be able to see it. Okay, we'll stop there. We don't need to get into that. But the Bible, already at the time here, when it's written here in Isaiah, says it's a sphere. It's round. There is roundness to it. This is before we actually discovered that it was in fact. Round. Why would they have this knowledge hundreds of years prior and people still wouldn't look at this, uh, look at this uh, into the facts and say, oh, well, the, the Bible says that it was round. But they discovered this on their own. God already knew it. I mean, he created it, right? So look at this next, Psalm 19.6. Psalm 19.6. It's, I have parentheses, the sun, the context, if you go back a couple of verses up into, into verse 4, uh, will indicate that this is the sun and what it's talking about. It says, its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. A couple of cool things in here about this one. One, there is a circuit. So up until, uh, I, I think, let me see if I have it in here. <clears throat> up until about the 17th, 18th century as well, um, and actually up until recently, in 1999, they did a study where they, the scientists charted where a star was and they wanted to see where it would move. And they charted it over a year. And they estimated that the galaxy in that star is traveling at over 600,000 miles per hour. 600,000 miles per hour. Prior to this understanding, or prior to the study uh, in, in the last couple hundred years, the idea was that the galaxy was solidified. It didn't move. It didn't move at all. And we were just stationary. Well, then we thought, okay, well, we, we rotate around the sun. The Earth in the Milky uh, Galaxy uh, rotates around the sun, but we're still stationary. Finally, they realized, no, the entirety of our galaxy is moving. It is moving. Here in Psalm 19.6, it explains that we're moving. The circuit, the sun is moving. 
The sun and its orbit and all the things around it are moving. And the psalmist knew that before man discovered it. So the sun is estimated to be traveling at 600,000 miles per hour, and it was thought to be fixed. Another thing we'll just throw in here, just as a fun little kicks and giggles side note, um, if this all happened by accident, if we all happened by accident, how is it that we're living well and we're traveling at 600,000 miles an hour and there's not any problem? We don't even know it. That happened by accident. How is that possible? And I'm not even talking about the rotation of the earth that is, is moving and then moving or just the rotation of the earth and then also its orbit around the sun and the speed that it's going plus the whole, the whole galaxy moving at 600,000 miles an hour. That happened by chance, right? I beg to differ. The next thing I want us to look at here is astronomy is Job 38, 19. There's a lot of nuggets in Job. Uh, if you like to, to go and look at Job, there are a lot of good nuggets found in Job speaking to this idea. It says in Job 38, 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light? In darkness, where is its place? So what is being said here by Job, it says God is actually talking to Job. It says light is said to be traveling in a way. The literal translation there, traveled in a road or a path, whereas darkness is a place. So again, up until the 17th century, light was to believe to be transmitted instantaneously. Instantaneously. And I can understand that. You turn a lantern on, right, and there's instant light. There's instant light. But it's actually traveling at 186,000 miles per second. That's why it looks like it's instant, right? And so we didn't discover that light actually travels, travels in a way and travels in a path. But Job, Job says, and God is actually, this is an argument that God is kind of making to Job, basically saying, Job, what do you know? You're questioning me, but what do you really know? Do you know where the way of the dwelling or the dwelling of the light is? Do you know the path that it takes? Do you know that darkness just has a place? In other words, Darkness does not travel. It is the absence of light. It is the absence of light. And we knew this in the Bible hundreds of years, thousands of years, prior to how we, when we first discovered it. The Bible already knew that. Now what's interesting about the Bible is the Bible doesn't take the current understanding of astronomy, of uh, the world as we know it, it doesn't. It goes beyond, above and beyond what the current idea. We're going to get into, probably next week, some things about medicine that are found in the Bible. And there's some things in which Egypt is practicing in their medicine. And Egypt was at the top, if you will, as far as, far as, as medicine and advancement. But some of the things we're doing, we're going to look at and go, what were they thinking? And the Bible is going to go, no, that's not what you do. It's not what you do. But that's for next week. So let's look then at oceanography. Oceanography, this is probably some of us that many of us have heard before. Ecclesiastes 1.7. It says, all the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. Now, if any of us has ever taken a science class, probably around third grade, we would understand what's going on here with this idea. Okay, but for a long time, people didn't understand that. So Mississippi dumps, on average, 6 million gallons of water per second into the Gulf of Mexico. 6 million gallons per second. Where does the water go? How does that happen? The Bible speaks about that. Look at Ecclesiastes 11.3. A, that is just the A meaning the first half of that verse. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. Okay, look here at Amos 9.6b, the second half of Amos 9.6. He who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. So between these three different verses, what do we have here? We have what's called the water cycle, Right? Most of you probably learned this in elementary school, the idea of the water cycle. The idea that 
the, the ocean, the water evaporates, goes into the clouds. The clouds move over to the earth, right? It dumps the water. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain over the earth. And then the water goes into what? We just saw it in two verses ago in Ecclesiastes 1, 7. All the rivers flow into the sea. All the rivers flow into the sea. So what's interesting is, again, the water cycle not fully understood until the 16th and 17th century. They didn't fully understand it. They didn't realize it. And then, and then, you know, some great scientists got all the accolades for discovering the water cycle, and God's like, I already gave it to you. It was in my word. I showed it to you. It's there. The water cycle is already found in the Bible. Oceanography again. Look at Job 38, 16. Have you ever entered into the springs of the sea? Or walked in the recesses of the deep. There has been found many different uh, spring waters, that is saltless waters, that has been found in the depths underneath the oceans. In Maui, there is a bay that, there, um, that is found there where they have found recesses of spring water that is there right within the salt water. They thought that would never be happening. That would never uh, be a, a possibility. Also, the recesses of the depth. Recesses or trenches is another translation you might have in your Bibles. As to that which is hidden, known only by investigation. And, and deep, as we often, as we read through the, the Bible, deep is usually describing the ocean or the seas. So interesting about that, in 1873, sciences, scientists founded a recess or a trench that was five and a half miles deep. Five and a half miles deep. Before that, their idea was that the ocean was not that deep. That it was actually rather shallow. But they find something that's five and a half miles down. And now we know that there is even trenches that are uh, over 30,000 feet down. And they didn't discover this. Now what's interesting is, of course, they didn't have the technology to discover this. Right? They wouldn't have the ability to discover that there was a trench because they wouldn't have the ability to go down into the depth to find it, first of all, or the technology like sonar and other things to go down and to pinpoint how deep it actually is. But again, Job tells us that they are there. They exist prior to us ever discovering it. What an amazing thing that we have and I, and I want you guys to to write these verses down I, i'm breaking this up this is you know somewhat of a you might be pretty excited about that this was somewhat of a short lesson coming from um james but i i decided to divide this up into two lessons because if i went one then we would be here for probably another 20 minutes so i'm breaking it up for you guys so you can take this all in but here's what i want us to do with these this types of these types of information we need to have these things ready to offer to people that question the inspiration of the Bible. Because a lot of people, as we talked about in a young adult class, really don't study the Bible. And they don't study the evidence that's against the Bible. All they usually bring up is what they've heard. They only bring up what they've heard. So like this morning we were talking about how the inspiration of the Bible and how it was copied and copied over and over and over again. The New Testament is 99.9% .9 accurate. But you'll have people that have come up and you go, hey, it's been translated over and over and over again. There's mistranslations. There's changing of languages. So you really can't be accurate to the Bible. That's just something they heard. That's not something really most likely that they've studied out for themselves. So when you go, well, you know, I believe the, the, the Bible is the word of God. Well, why do you believe that? Well, let me show you some things that are really interesting that the Bible talked about. Let me show you about astronomy and how it says the sun was moving. And before, you know, science didn't understand that until the 17th, 18th century. Let me, let me show you what it talks about oceanography. Let me tell you about what the Bible says about scientific things that weren't discovered until... 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century, but the Bible already knew it. That's significant. That's impactful. 
Those are little things, little nuggets that we can have ready to show to people and go, hey, well, how do you explain this? We have to be prepared, as Peter says, to defend our faith. And these are small little ways that we can plant nuggets of information to our friends, to our family. Have you ever thought about this? Did you ever realize what Job said? Those are small little things that we can share that can be impactful. And then when the next conversation comes up, you go, hey, look at this one. Hey, look at this one. Hey, consider this one. Have you ever considered the unity of the Bible? And hopefully it will start to poke holes at what they believe. They'll start to be impacted by God's word. Because oftentimes what we do is we will just kind of bring up a defense off the top of our head to explain something to them which is not necessarily inherently a bad thing, but if we can get them going to the Bible and go, let me show you something in Job chapter 38 that you might find interesting. It talks about the deeps and the trenches of the sea. Let me show you where it says it right here in Job 38. Let me tell you about in Isaiah where it talks about the sun and its circuit. Then we're getting them into the word and they're hearing God's word, whether they believe it's God's word or not. But if we understand God's word, don't we know that God's word is the one that transforms us? That's that's like an amen comment, right? It's God's word that transforms us, not us transforming people. So we've got to be able to use these small little things and go, well, let me tell you about what Job says. And let them see God's word for what it says. And then share with them the science that they believe. And go, God already knew that. I think that's powerful. But it's up to us. That's why I wanted you guys to write these verses down and and put down in your your Bibles if you can. And write down astronomy. Write down oceanography. We're going to look at physics. We're going to look at at, uh, medicine as well uh, in a couple of weeks. These are small little things that I think can be impactful because we have to be about the sharing of God's word. We're not all evangelists, but we are all called to defend our faith. So I hope these things will help you in doing that. If you are here for, for, uh, maybe you weren't planning on being here this morning and God brought you here this morning, I'm thankful that you are here this morning. If you are struggling with something and you need, uh, you need some encouragement, you need some prayers on behalf of this congregation, we would love to sit down and, and meet with you and help you out if we can uh, to, to help out in your needs. If you are uh, been here and you haven't really studied the Bible before and you would like to have a Bible study, we would more than uh, love to have a, a Bible study with you and answer your questions that you might have about God, about church, about salvation. We would love to sit down with you and do that. Um, if you have a need, please let us know before you leave here. We're going to stand up and and sing uh, our last song here, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. So let's go ahead and stand and sing.